when the imagination ignites. You are pulled into either a world of the fantastic or a world of the dark and twisted. But not everything that is dark and twisted is fiction. And even old stories are based upon some truth. That truth gets recorded in the Pluto Archives. The air in the old, dilapidated house felt heavy in my chest. I could hear the rain lightly bouncing off the roof. The darkness encompassed me with its faint smell of dampness. However, the more steps I took into the building, the more oppressive the darkness became. I did not believe in ghosts or demons, nor did I believe in the paranormal in general. I classified myself as a level-headed individual with beliefs based on fact, yet here I was, in the middle of the night, out in the boonies, alone, in a light rain, chasing ghosts. As my steps took me further into the darkness, I thought to myself, why am I so skittish? There is no reason for me to be this way. This is just an old rundown building. I paused to listen to the silence, but there was no absence of sound. I could hear my breath, the rain outside, and the creaking of the old structure using its last defenses against the weather that threatened to onslaught it. I moved past the foyer, deciding not to climb the once grand staircase that led to the upper floor and leaned against the wall. As I stood there, still as a board, listening to the sounds of the night, a distinct set of footsteps invades my ears. Very faint at first, but the steps became more prominent. I realized that they were moving directly above me, in the direction of the stairs, each sound of a shoe on the wood becoming louder and louder. I held my breath so that my ears could concentrate on the creaking floorboards and the footfalls that now reached the stairs. I heard a muted thump as the first step was breached, then another thump and another step. I pressed my body against the wall, trying to become part of the flower paper that had not peeled off yet. I strained my ears, trying to detect any other sound coming from the footsteps. Breathing, a rustling of clothes, but there was nothing, nothing but thumps. Was I alone? I was sure I was. There was no other cars or people for that matter for at least 10 miles, yet I could distinctly hear a thump. 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 There couldn't be many stairs left before whoever or whatever reached the main level, reached me. How did I get into this mess in the first place, you may ask? I would like to tell you that it was some dare that I was roped into completing, but that would not be true. It all stems back to the research I was doing in the library about historic buildings in our town. I came across some old newspaper clippings about the completion of the Whitmore House with its tall turrets, multiple floors, and grand staircases. The dates on the article suggested that this house could be the oldest building in the county. The more I searched for information about the house, the more snippets I found about strange occurrences there. It seems to me that the first of such activity was about a week after Mrs. Whitmore, the original owner's wife, passed away from mysterious circumstances. I found her obituary by accident when I cross-referenced the name of the house with the library's research database. When I clicked on her name, Lillian Whitmore, a picture of a beautiful young woman appeared on the screen in black and white. She was striking with light, intelligent eyes, and she was wearing a beautiful white dress. I can only assume that this picture was taken on her wedding day to Mr. Whitmore. The death announcement was brief, stating that she passed away before her time, with a great future ahead of her, noting that her husband was her only living relative. No cause of death was mentioned. I took the obit and put it aside for future reference if need be. The next article that I pursued was a front page story about a builder's apprentice who claimed he had seen the dead lady of the house looking down at him from the west turret window one morning when he arrived to work. When he looked up to meet her gaze, her eyes were missing and all that remained were two pits of darkness, fathomless black holes. The article stated that when he noticed her missing eyes, he tripped over some wood and was knocked out by the fall. His obituary followed about a week after the article was published. Cause of death? Unknown. The more I researched about the Whitmore House, the more information about the peculiar activities revealed themselves to me. 
all in all, there were a dozen recorded deaths on the property. However, each death note is clearly leaving out what caused their passing. Yet, if you scoured the local newspaper about three days before the obituaries were printed, you'd find a story that involves the deceased, the Whitmore house, and the lady with the missing eyes. After finding a dozen deaths that met this criterion, I needed to know more. I needed to see this house and the lady for myself. As the footfalls continued, panic started to well up in me, producing a slow, churning feeling right in the middle of my stomach, breaking me out of my musing. Thump. The fight or flight response was so overwhelming, causing my senses to urge me to run. The darkness impeded my escape route as my eyes would not adjust to the lack of ambient light. Thump. Thump. With those two sounds, I knew that whatever was on the stairs had reached the main level. Without looking back, I ran blindly away from the invader, crashing through the only door available at the end of the hallway. Pushing through the blackness with urgency, I stumbled into the room in front of me. The door I so unceremoniously crashed through broke into several long, sharp pieces under my weight. Not caring if I was hurt in the fall, I sprang to my feet with the need to flee, taking over my entire being. Unbeknownst to me, the footsteps had ceased. Searching in the blackness for an alcove to hide in or hidden exit I may have missed. I searched around my jacket pocket for a small flashlight I had hidden there. Upon removal, I noticed that it made a new rattling sound. It must have taken a hit on the floor in the fall and was now barely working only providing me with a weak beam of illumination. I scanned the area, quickly waving my flashlight back and forth, left to right, only glimpsing tiny fragments of the room, little clues to let me know where I was in the house. There were structures high up on the wall, broken, with doors hanging off. The room had a musty odor like old rotting potatoes. I could only assume that this is the storage area or a pantry at one time. Of course, That was until I saw the old cast iron stove to the far left. I was in the kitchen, the heart of the home, and all I could think of was how do I get out of this room? Across from the giant stove was an area of blackness. I thought to myself, could this be a place I could hide? I rushed over hoping that this could be my salvation from whoever had just come down the stairs. As I crept closer, The weak beam of the flashlight flickered across a small set of stairs leading up and out of the kitchen. Were these servant stairs? I did not waste any time climbing the stairs, my desire to put as much space between me and whoever was in the house with me. I stopped at the first landing, my heart racing as I tried to catch my breath. I tried to be as silent as possible, holding my breath as to not make a sound. I strained to hear the sounds of the house, the rain on the roof, the creaking of the old tree outside swaying in the wind, and the thumps of feet striking the floor. I could hear the rain and the tree, but I could no longer hear the footfalls on the floor. It was as if they had never existed. I stood at the top of the servant stairs in the dark for quite a while, waiting to see if the thumps would return. To my relief, They did not. As I transversed the second floor of the house with my defective flashlight, I came across broken furniture, peeling paint, and empty rooms. The musty smell permeated everything saturating your nose. It looked like no one had occupied the home for decades, if the scarcity of belongings was any indication. As I reached the only room at the front of the house on this floor, the air seemed to change. The musty aroma that seemed to follow me through the house was replaced with the softest scents of lavender and vanilla. Odd, I said out loud to myself as I breached the entryway. When I entered the room, I could feel the oppressive darkness that the house emanates begin to lift. The room was very large and had several intact windows facing east, providing it with the best sunrise in the county. The room was also contained a fireplace and a lone rocking chair, probably something kids had brought in to aid with the spookiness of the property. I approached the window to look at the expanse of land the view afforded. Pushing away lace curtains, I noticed that they were in excellent condition. 
the curtains were soft white and still hung level, very unlike the other rooms I had recently visited. In front of the window was a tiny wooden table with a mostly used candle in the middle. The candle seemed newer than its surroundings and accompanied a box of wood matches. Apparently others had been to this house and left these for future guests. I took a match out of the small box and slid it across the comb, producing a light scent of sulfur and lit the melted candle. Instantly, the room was bathed in a soft glow, causing my apprehension to subside. You're back, a happy voice said from behind me, the smell of lavender increasing as I turned around to face the sound. In front of me was the apparition of a beautiful young woman with striking light eyes, wearing a beautiful white dress. She seemed to float toward the rocking chair and lower herself into it. Have you come back to hear more? She smiled as she sat. My confusion must have been evident on my face. She continued. I was in love with Matt. He was older, yes, but he made me feel alive. He asked me to marry him three times, you know, before I agreed. I thought we would be together forever, and I guess in a way we are. She seemed to trail off into thought. I did not move or make a sound, not wanting to break the spell she seemed to have woven. Shaking off her contemplation, she turned her gaze back to me and continued. The first few months were like a lover's dream. When I told him I was with child, his attitude changed. He became dark and hateful, accusing me of ruining his life. She spat out the last words in disgust. I had no idea he had that kind of evil in him. I had been led to believe that he loved me, but I was a prize for him, and now I was a liability. I realized at that moment that I was listening to Lillian Whitmore herself, a ghost, an apparition, recite her story for me. I stood there frozen as she continued. It was an unusually cold warning. Max had come into my bedchamber to see if my fire had burned out the night, which I had thought was kind of him. Unusual, but kind. Our relationship had been strained since the baby proclamation. He started the fire and was blowing on the flames to increase the warmth in the room. Once the fire was raging, he came and sat on the side of my bed and rubbed the blankets encasing my legs. Then he smiled at me with that smile of his. His smile could make me weak in the knees, and was one of the reasons I accepted his proposal. I had no idea. He had the fire poker sitting in the coals getting hotter. Her voice trailed off into silence. I waited for her to speak again. She looked at me and slightly shook her head, then continued. I thought he was going to check the fire for me. When he had gotten up from the bed, I did not realize what he was actually doing until I felt the poker steer my belly and a scream escape my mouth. The look of shock was still on her face as she told this part of her story. He pulled out the poker and slammed it back into my abdomen over and over and over again. He pulled out the poker and then reinserted it into my middle. I was no longer moving. He flung it back into the fire her gaze penetrating mine as she continued. I was looking up at the ceiling when my spirit left my body. Max was screaming for me not to look at him. Don't look at me. But it was too late. Don't look at me. My soul was gone. As I was looking down at my body, he went to the fire and took out the hot poker. I can still see him standing over me as he pushed the poker into my right eye, burning the contents within. He kept yelling for me to quit looking at him as he pushed the poker into my other eye. The smell of burning flesh started to seep into the room, filling my nose. I was half expecting Maxwell Whitmore to appear. The ghost cleared her throat to capture my attention. I slowly turned towards her. The sockets that once held ice blue eyes were now fathomless pits of black. I held a scream in my throat and covered my mouth with my hands just in case my muscles could not contain the sound trying to escape. I looked towards the only door in the room and lunged toward it. She did not chase after me, but let out a little giggle and whispered, (laughs) I'm not the one to be afraid of in this house. There are darker things that reside here. I was not sure of her meaning, but continued with my escape. 
As I left the room, her apparition slowly disseminated into dust. I found myself at the top of the grand staircase looking down into the foyer. The idea that someone was just on these stairs was not lost on me. I took the first step waiting to hear a thump on the wood. Nothing but silence extended out from the floor. I took another step. Silence. I continued down the stairway until I reached the main level, all in silence. I felt completely alone as I turned to the open front door. A breeze blew some old newspaper and dirt up from the floor before abruptly slamming it and pushing my hair into my face. I grabbed the newspaper clipping out of the air as it floated to the ground. It was another story about the house. Part of the story was missing, but the part that was left mentioned a young woman who looks out the front window of the house. She moves the curtains back to look out onto the property. Sometimes she lights a candle so that others can find their way. Other times, her face is covered with her dark locks. Dark locks? I mouth the words out loud. My ghost did not have dark locks. I stated firmly but continued to read the snippet. Apparently the woman only materialized one month out of the year and her candle burns every night for 30 days. Then it's gone until next year. I sigh as I wish there was more to the newspaper story and let the paper fall to the ground. Tonight, I had experienced the paranormal and I was ready to leave. I took a step towards the front door and I heard a thump on the second floor landing above me. I grasped the knob, pulling with all my might, willing the door to open so I could leave this nightmare. It would not budge. I turned around, running through the hallway that I now knew led to the kitchen, a new sense of deja vu prickling my skin. As I burst through the kitchen entryway, I tripped over a pile of debris on the floor, sending me sprawling. I could not recollect what this debris was, except for the already broken door. The aroma of rotting potatoes hit me, violating my nose. The smell guaranteed I was in the kitchen. I turned on my wonky flashlight and aimed it at the pile. The beam illuminated a heap of clothes. I approached with caution and gently touched the material. It seemed familiar to me somehow and gave off a faint smell of citrus. Bones fell out of the fabric as I lifted it up, making a hollow sound as they hit the ground. I crouched down next to the mound of bones and directed my flashlight upon the floor. A large piece of sharp wood was lodged between the ribs of the skeleton, protruding into where the heart would have rested had the corpse been not fully decomposed. A flash of sparkle caught my eye as the dim light from the flashlight roamed over the pile. I picked up the sparkle, recognizing the necklace. It was my necklace. This was my body. The dizziness from the epiphany overtook my body and the room went dark. When I woke, the air in the old, dilapidated house felt heavy in my chest. I could hear the rain lightly bouncing off the roof. The darkness encompassed me with its faint smell of dampness. However, the more steps I took into the building, the more oppressive the darkness became. I did not believe in ghosts or demons, nor did I believe in the paranormal in general. I classified myself as a level-headed individual with beliefs based on fact, yet here I was, in the middle of the night, out in the boonies, alone, in a light rain, chasing ghosts. If you have enjoyed our podcast... Please let us know by liking, subscribing, and telling all your friends. See you next time on the Pluto Archives. This story was written by A.D. Morris, narrated by Azure M., produced and directed by Noah J. Morris. This has been a Puka production. (laughs) 